Hello, and welcome back to uh, Beyond Networks, The Evolution of Living Systems. So today, we're going to dive into the central topic of the lecture, the nitty gritty, networks and mechanistic explanations in biology. And so I, I ended the last module with this slide saying that a network graph, like we can see, see here, also called a hairball graph in systems biology sometimes, is a tool, a thinking tool, an epistemic tool to, to understand an actual system. It provides a perspective, a formal system that in a way represents an actual system but in a specific way. So let's sort of try and develop what I mean by that uh, in this module and specifically this lecture, which is called Networkology. And so I want to sort of remind you that um, we said that there are actual systems, patterned processes, interacting processes that generate some recognizable pattern or behavior. Uh, there are formal systems, set of sets of relations between mathematical objects. For example, variables that are described by equations and propositions and the act of modeling is trying to sort of bring them into congruence in some way that depends, remember, uh, on the motives and the questions of a modeler as an agent. And so this sort of definition of a formal system as a set of relations between mathematical objects lends itself very easily uh, to visual description. So let's do it. Let's represent all those variables that are in these formal systems by these circles here. Variable one, two, three, four, five, six, in different colors. And let's represent the relationships between those variables by lines. Very simply, we add lines, okay? These variables interact. Remember, uh, mathematical objects like variables can describe processes. They don't have to be things. And so we end up with a network, very simple, very straightforward, very intuitive way to represent the formal system. And so the, the, the network uh, graph that we see here is sort of the natural way of representing a formal system. A graph has a very sort of uh, uh, specific mathematical definition. It is a mathematical structure which is used to, uh, to model pairwise relations between objects. Okay, that doesn't get us much, much further. Last time we were, we were talking about how the sort of tools, um, formalisms we use for modeling constrain what we can do. And so the mathematical um, discipline that's behind this is called graph theory and it's encoded in set theory based on set theory, basically. And it allows us to, to look at these graphs, to sort of classify them and to work with them. So we're gonna develop a few uh, concepts here from graph theory. One is that the different variables that are related here in this formal model, they are the network nodes, okay? So the different uh, circles in this graph, uh, and they are connected by edges, links, also called vertices. So the set of all nodes and vertices make up the mathematical network graph. And we can now use the tools of graph theory to analyze what is called the structure or also the topology of the network. I'm not gonna use the word topology in this context anymore because we're gonna use it in a different way later on and it may be confusing. But in the literature, it often shows up as network topology. I'll use network structure. So another distinction before we move on, just very quickly, we can have an undirected graph as in the example that I was showing you here. So two nodes can be connected by one edge and it doesn't have a direction. Whether it goes from variable four to variable six or the other way around, it's the same relation. But a lot of systems are represented by 
directed graphs where the relations have arrows and they go in specific directions or sometimes in both, but you have to sort of specifically indicate that. Two different, very different types, the classes of graphs. What are, you know, we can use these graphs to, to uh, represent all kinds of systems in the real world. Of course, computer networks are sort of the, the quintessential technological application. Different topologies of computer networks are shown here. This is a fascinating picture. It's not astronomy. It's a visualization of a part of the World Wide Web, 1999. Um, it's a visualization of a data set that was used in a pioneering study of networkology, like I call it here, of sort of looking at the global structure of networks and characterizing the networks through that. Of course, networks are everywhere. We have social networks, business, business networks that span the whole globe, travel networks. They're all interconnected as we're finding out the hard way. It's very easy to get from China to Europe um, through those networks. Food webs in ecology, of course, who eats who, uh, very classical network applications. And of course, in systems biology, uh, the famous hairball. Here is an example uh, where someone mushed up a fly and uh, checked which proteins stick together and made this beautiful hairball graph. It won a prize at the Drosophila meeting uh, in 2011. And it shows you the stickiness of Drosophila proteins. We have obviously also gene regulatory networks that are really big in systems biology. Like this from Eric Davidson's lab, we'll come back to this many, many times as an example. It depicts the gene regulatory network um, that controls endomesoderm fate in early sea urchin development. Don't worry about the details, but here the nodes are genes and the relations are regulatory interactions between them. So networks, networks everywhere. And from the, the massive sort of big data sets that science is, is currently gathering, we have a, a tremendous treasure of data um, where we can reconstruct from which we can reconstruct such networks and then look, um, statistically analyze their structure. There are two ways of doing this. One is to look at the global structure of a network and characterize uh, it in its entirety, okay? So what you could do, for example, is you could count the number of edges that go from one node to another. So this is called the node degree. We're gonna introduce a few, just a few measures and, and I'm gonna tell you what they can do. So the node degree, uh, tells you how many edges connect to each node in the network. These are the numbers for this particular example. So you have one very highly connected node here, another one that's kind of highly connected, and then a lot of them have the same sort of uh, uh, node uh, degree of two. Two connections go into each one of those nodes. In directed graphs, of course, it gets a bit more complicated. There you have to count the number of edges that go in and the number of edges that go out. And these are called in degrees and out degrees, respectively, for incoming degree and outgoing degree. We're gonna switch back to the simpler example here. What you can do uh, to characterize the global structure of a network is you can uh, draw up a degree distribution, which you obtain by counting the nodes, the number of nodes, which have a specific degree. So how many nodes are not connected? Zero, connected only with one edge, two edges, and so on and so forth, and then dividing by the total number of nodes. So this shows you the relative frequency of, of uh, node degrees in the network. In our specific example, we have quite a few nodes with, um, with degree two, node degree two, one, with three and one really highly connected one, variable number seven there, with a degree of five. And this is called the degree distribution P of K for the network. So if you do this for really large networks, you can classify different kinds of networks. For example, you can draw up a random network. You take a bunch of random nodes, some number, and you say, okay, we're gonna connect those nodes with a random you know, set of edges. Every edge you put in a network is completely randomly determined. And so if you analyze the resulting network, you will get a, a node degree distribution that looks like this. It's a Gaussian distribution. It has 
uh, an average, a typical average degree. So there are uh, nodes that have, most nodes in the network have a specific number of connections to them. Okay. And then in a Gaussian, uh, from this number, the number of nodes that have more or less connections will fall off exponentially. And it looks like this uh, normal bell curve. You can have different networks that are called scale-free networks, though, that have a very different distribution. It's plotted here on a log-log scale, it makes a straight line. And those of you who are remembering their math will uh, realize that this characterizes a parallel distribution. We'll get back to that in a second. Well, you could draw up a really beautiful hierarchical network. Remember, we said um, uh, systems, biological systems are hierarchical. Here is a, a, a rather sort of regular hierarchical network, which is self-similar. There, there are motives of the network that repeat each uh, themselves at different scales. And again, you get this parallel distribution uh, in the degree uh, distribution graph. Okay, so depending on their degree distribution, you can distinguish random networks from those that have a more interesting structure. So let's focus in on the most interesting case there in the middle. That's not quite obvious uh, to figure out. So the most important thing you need to know about parallel distributions is that they have a fat tail. This is something that everybody should know nowadays. So that means that most uh, elements in that parallel distribution, most nodes in the network have few connections. But some of them, rare number, but not negligible, have a lot. So most of the network nodes are peripheral nodes, they're called, marked in red here with few connections to them, while there are a few network hubs with a high number of connections. And although they are very few compared to the peripheral nodes, they are incredibly important because they have such a high number of connections. So if something happens to them, that has a much bigger effect than if something happens to a peripheral node. The parallel distribution uh, plotted on a linear scale looks like this. So you have a very fast drop. There are a lot of nodes in the network with few edges. And then you have a fat tail that drops off really, really slowly. A few nodes have a lot, a lot of edges. These are the hubs in the network. And that's different from the random network. If you compare that to the, the degree distribution of a random network, remember, that was a Gaussian curve. And the tail of the Gaussian was falling off exponentially. So what I'm plotting here is an exponential in blue versus a parallel. And you can now see what I mean by a fat tail. Basically, in a random network, most nodes are very, very close to the average node degree. So let's say it's, it's four connections. Most, depending on the density of the edges, most uh, uh, nodes in this network will have four. Um, Few will have five, and almost no node will have 10. It's almost impossible to find a node with 10 um, connections. You'd have to be very, 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 very lucky. But in a parallel, you will have rare nodes that have 10 edges coming in. And that's what's called the fat tail. So this particular structure, if you have a network with this structure, it's called a scale-free structure because there is no typical node degree, no average node degree, right? There's no peak in the distribution like in the random network that you saw before. This particular architecture of a network has a few interesting um, uh, characteristics compared to random networks. So random networks, in those, most nodes are very similar to each other. And so they're close to the average number of edges in the network. And that means when you have perturbations, they all are about the same. And they're quite sensitive, these networks, towards perturbation of the random nodes. There's, so if you remove a node, each node is very sort of important right, for the functioning of the network. While in a scale-free network, you have two different types of nodes. Remember, peripheral nodes versus the hubs. And the hubs are rare but they are the most important components of the network. 
because if you knock out any number of these peripheral nodes, not much is happening. So these sort of scale-free networks are robust towards perturbation of random nodes. For example, the World Wide Web, the internet itself, is very robust towards uh, any sort of individual server breaking down because most of the servers on the internet are only uh, connected to a few other servers. But if one of the hubs goes down, it's a big problem. Okay, so if you hit one of the hubs, you're in big trouble. So these systems are both robust, but they are very sensitive to this sort of rare event that causes a lot of damage. And I just can't pitch uh, Nassim Taleb's work enough. So this is the topic, of course, of his book, The Black Swan. These rare events that take out a hub in the node are unpredictable. And they have such severe consequences compared to all the other random perturbations that they will come to dominate the history of the network. So unpredictability. If you're living in such a scale-free network, you are very, very sensitive to these rare events. OK, let's talk about two more measures that you can apply to, to the sort of uh, structure of a network. The first one is, again, about the global structure of a network. So, so far, we've looked at sort of the, the, the distribution of the, the, the node degrees and whether they're random or whether there's different types of nodes. So instead of a hierarchical network, we're now going to um, compare random and scale-free networks to a regular lattice network here on a square lattice. OK, and a very sort of influential paper from 1998 found out that if you have a random um, network. So take a step back. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. So basically, what we looked at before is sort of, OK, what is the node, the degree distributions? Are there nodes that are different, or are there nodes that are the same? Here, we're looking at how big is the network, really? So we're, we're trying to measure distance. For example, you're interested, again, in, in finding out how long does it take a virus to get from China to Europe through a travel network, a business, an international business network. And so you're measuring either the shortest path through the network or the mean path length. So you connect any two nodes and you calculate the mean number of steps you take to get from one to the other. And that gives you a sort of a measure of how large, how far apart are these nodes in the network? In this, in this sense, how large is this network? Now, the problem is these measures depend crucially on how the network is wired. Once again, if you have a random network, uh, the distance between any two nodes is very small, okay? So it, you, you get very quickly from one node to the other. What I'm doing here is I'm, so we've sort of ordered all the network nodes and put them in a circle. If you have a regular lattice network, you can see that, you know, we've arranged them so that they are next to their neighbors here. And you can see there's a very regular connection sort of architecture here. Now, what's interesting is that scale-free networks have very few of these long, sort of long distance connections that are prevalent in the random network, but only a few of those make the shortest path length extremely short. And this is, of course, was made famous through Stanley Milgram's experiments, sending letters out and asking people to send them on to eventually reach a, 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 a destination, a random destination. And it turned out that most of the letters got back to Milgram in six steps or less. So these are the famous six degrees of separation. So a lot of biological, social, uh, technological networks are not just scale-free. They are what uh, is called small world networks. They have a very compact sort of path length compared to ran um, uh, regular networks. So they're somewhere between random and regular uh, in terms of their, their sort of size, their connectivity as well. Last measure of networkology that we're going to talk about is homing in on local network structure. So far, we've been looking at degree distributions. Are there different types of nodes in the network or the size of the whole network and how connectivity affects that real size? Um, not just the number of nodes, but the sort of time it takes to travel across the network. And now we're going to look at how each individual node is, is connected and how that differs from other nodes. And, and the, the, Sort of way you can do this is by measuring the clustering coefficient 
of each node. That coefficient is calculated by drawing triangles. So you, you calculate how many triangles go through a node and divided by how many triangles could go through a node. So let's take uh, node number six here in this network. I, and you know, let me show you what I mean by triangles. So basically, uh, if you have uh, connections to, to other nodes, uh, those nodes are neighbors of this node, okay? So if we, if we count all the different nodes in that are connected, we find out that this node is actually connected to every other node in the network. So this entire network is the neighborhood of this particular node. And so in this neighborhood, we're going to check out uh, how many triangles could there be and how many triangles are there. So here's a triangle. Uh, V6 is connected to V2, V6 is connected to V4, and V4 is connected to V2. In a social network, friends of yours are usually also friends themselves. Okay, but here are a few, V6 to V4, V6 to V5, that are not triangles. So we can calculate the, the total number of possible triangles in this network, it's 10, and the number of triangles uh, V6 is involved in, which are three. So basically we get a clustering coefficient of 30% or 0 0.3. Take another node, V1 is connected to other nodes. So its neighborhood are only these two nodes and they are connected in a triangle. So V1 is completely clustered a uh, clustering coefficient of 1.0, and so on and so forth. So we can characterize the clustering coefficient across the whole network. We can um, calculate the average. We can also draw a distribution analogous to the degree distribution and say, okay, we calculate the average clustering coefficient for nodes of the same degree. And that gives us a distribution that again helps us distinguish networks. Remember, that we could distinguish random networks from scale-free or hierarchical networks by using the degree distribution, but both scale-free networks and hierarchical networks had the same parallel distribution. And so uh, they were in this sense the same. If we um, sort of plot the clustering coefficient distribution here, we find out that at, for this measure, random networks and scale-free networks are uh, showing this sort of flat distribution. So nodes of different degrees, they cluster the same way, while the hierarchical network, of course, has a, a dependency. The higher, the more highly you're connected, the hubs in this network here are less clustered because they are regularly connected to all the other parts of the network. And then the members of each cluster here have a lower degree distribution. Um, this is quite intuitively clear. Okay, so this is interesting. You can read something out. So, uh, the, the, the hubs in this hierarchical regular network are different than the hubs uh, in the scale-free network. And in terms of clustering, uh, the hubs here, they can belong to clusters or not, just like any other node. They are not special or different from the peripheral hubs. So now we've, we've, we've defined a bunch of measures to tell us, okay, we've got robust networks, they're small worlds, so, um, uh, they're not robust in this sense that hub, you know, if you, if you hit a hub, you can knock it out. And also perturbations can travel very, signals can travel very quickly through the networks. And we looked at some, some more local structure um, clustering. So if you take this sort of approach systematically and apply it over a whole network, there's lots of different uh, algorithms to do this. You discover, uh, the community structure of the network. So community structure means the different modules that a network has. So for example, here's a, a, a pioneering study from 2002, and you can see a very modular network where it's very visibly clear which one of these nodes are clustered or not. So basically, the algorithm not only needs to calculate the uh, cluster coefficients, but also check, of course, the neighborhoods of these uh, clustered nodes. Here is a much bigger uh, network based on real data. Uh, again, protein-protein interaction data uh, that show you uh, different factors that interact and, and form clusters that correspond uh, to functions in the cell, like the proteasome uh, or intracellular signaling cascades, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so very powerful. And of course, um, oh, well, there's one limitation. Often uh, there are hub proteins in scale-free networks that are uh, between different clusters. Okay, because the, the networks in biology are both scale-free and a little bit hierarchical as well. And so there are algorithms that detect overlapping clusters as well. So this can get quite complicated. But what we're detecting here are structural modules. Okay, so these are um, clusters. The more clusters are present, the more modular the structure of the network. That means certain nodes are more connected to each other than to other parts of the network within. That's within each module, there are more connections than between modules. And so that is a way, of course, to make the network uh, robust against perturbations. Even if you hit a hub within that module, only that one module, that one cluster is likely to fail because it has few connections to the rest of the network. So this is uh, a way to break contagion on a network. This is why localism is important. Break the supply chains, make essential products locally. If you don't travel so much globally, viruses will not spread this fast. So it's a way of making networks more robust. And of course, uh, structural modularity may also enable the functional decomposition of large networks. So far, we've looked at the structure of networks. We tried to sort of classify them, and we tried to find some sort of very general characteristics towards perturbation, uh, towards contagion on a network, spread of information, that sort of thing. But what we want to do, if we have a biological network, of course, we want to know what it does. And for that, we have to subdivide, decompose it. And modularity, structural modularity, seems to show us the way in. So we're going to look at that in the next lecture. We're going to have a look at whether we can sort of subdivide the network into little chunks that we can understand, and whether we can then reconstruct the sort of functioning of a whole network like that. But before we do that, let me just quickly wrap up and connect back to the philosophical part of the lecture. So now um, I have introduced uh, network graphs as a specific type of model based on mathematical graphs and graph theory. And they are representations, perfect, natural, straightforward representations of formal systems. Very powerful, very powerful epistemic tools to analyze global and local network structure. And so network graphs are tools. They are not the underlying system. They are idealizations, abstractions, that provide a structural perspective on the underlying actual system. Remember, the actual system is a pattern process. We have abstracted out its members and its correlations, its relationships between each other. And a lot of network scientists are saying, we've overcome reductionism with this. But still, we are reducing the system to an abstract graph instead of looking at its full dynamic potential. And in the next lecture, when we, we start to look at how to decompose the structure of a network and infer function from structure, we will see how this approach hits its limits very quickly. And we need to think really hard how to get beyond those limits. I hope you join me for that next time. Thanks for listening and bye now.